Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by Allstate Insurance, Jared Mayo of Martin, Tennessee. Thank you, Zach, and welcome everybody to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Zach. Before we talk to Derek, our very special guest today, what's something you discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? I thought it would be fitting for today's podcast to discover something in Simmons Bank Ag Center. And in in addition to seeing today's guest as part of our Faces of Farming exhibit, I discovered that 18% of the world's beef comes from the U.S. while using only 6% of the world's cattle. Very interesting. Thank you very much. The Innovation in Agriculture exhibit has a lot of really interesting facts like that. So anybody who visits should check that out. So our guest today is Derek Giffen. Uh, Derek and Michaela are um, live, live here in Obion County. Um, he is the fifth generation. Is that right, Farmer? Is that right? All right. Yes, sir. So take us back a little bit. I'm... Uh, curious because i love history and i especially love west tennessee history uh do you know much about the fifth generation back we it's funny you ask that we've been talking a little bit about that lately and you know where we originally originated i don't i don't really know but uh we've been here in this area since the mid 1800s and i do know the uh i guess the first generation of farm here was also a school teacher here in one of these local communities and he farmed on the side too, you know, and, you know, at that time they were farming with mules and everything was horse drawn or, uh, you know, very, very manual, uh, labor. And, uh, it's changed a lot since then. And I think we actually, I think we were actually still using horses until the sixties. My, uh, great granddad was pretty hard headed and he, uh, he was determined to plant with mules. So <laughs> that was still a, uh, still a big part of our operation even even not so long ago it seems like but yeah we have we have pictures much. of my west tennessee family farming and my grandfather is an adult and he's holding a whole bunch of mules and they're using them to farm and so i mean that's in you know i have that memory from my lifetime so when my dad was growing up you know he must have been doing that too what's interesting is you can you can go all the way back farmer to farmer to farmer and I was curious, so I looked it up, and you're definitely in a, in a uh, minority. Only 3% of farms remain in the same family past four generations. So um, I think, isn't there a, uh, I mean, there I know there is, I just don't know the details, a century farm here in Tennessee. Um, that's a little program. Are you guys in that? We are, yes, sir. Yep. Um, the farm that my great-grandfather was born on uh, is a century farm, and it's not where our main shop is located. It's about a mile away, but um, they've kind of been in this area, you know, for a long time. And we've got a couple other tracks that are old enough to be Century Farms, but we've not been through the program, you know, not those yet. But the main home place has been, yes, sir. So, so back up just for you in your memory, what you remember. Tell us about growing up on a farm here in um, Obion County. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I was born in 93, so I'm still pretty green, but, um, even just in a short amount of time, it has changed so much, you know, and we were talking about all the manual labor that used to be done, you know, no cabs, no air conditioning, all that kind of stuff. And we were talking about guys, you know, not wanting to retire. It seems like farmers, they don't, they don't ever want to retire. You know, they're 80 years old, still out there. And you have to think about that some, and honestly, it's really, you know, they've, it's easier now than it's ever been. So why would they want to, you know, you know, they've seen all of the hard stuff and growing up, you know, we, we were running cab tractors and cab combines, you know, so I really don't know what it's like to be in an open cab all day, but um, just the, the technology change from then until now, it's incredible. You can, you can measure everything down to the 10th acre and apply, you know, your nutrients and whatever you need to, uh, it's just gotten so, so scientific almost, you know, it's changed a whole lot. So when you, uh, were little, did your parents get you up, 
you know, or your dad or whatever gets you up to start working in the field and working on the farm, you know, before you went to school? Is it the standard old story that you hear from from folks who are in farming? Probably not quite as bad. Uh, I think my dad and my granddad had it a lot harder than I did. You know, we had small tasks to take care of, like chickens or, you know, had a few cows or something like that that I was in charge of. But uh, I guess I really didn't start driving a tractor or combine until I was about nine or 10, you know, by myself. I was with dad or granddad, you know, with them in the tractor or combine. But, uh, I guess the change and, you know, the equipment size kind of, they didn't feel too comfortable letting me go solo until about that age, but, um, been around it my whole life though, to some extent. Yeah. I remember when I was little, we had a tiny, we had horses and just a tiny bit of work like that. And I remember hating having to walk behind the trailer and pick up hay and throw mm -hmm. it on, out of the field. I mean, I, I, I do have, I remember fixing bob wire fences and things like that. Yep. Um, so that, so those were fun. Now here though, I was living really in this, in the very much in the outskirts of a major city here. It, it feels to me like the schools also do a good job of preparing young ag workers um, with the fair and with the different programs through FFA and talk a little bit about that, what you remember from, from that, from your school. Yeah. So um, growing up, I think ever since fourth grade, I was in 4-H and uh, they had a livestock judging team and different things like that. And I was on that and all throughout high school, you know, I was in FFA and different things and then same way in college. But uh, like, even as a kid being on livestock judging, you, you kind of participate on the participate in those things, not really knowing how it will, you know, add to the rest of your life. But honestly, I still use those skills today. You know, it's, it's amazing how you retain that information and just use it if you're going to stay in the business. And, uh, I am very thankful that those programs exist because, uh, I know, you know, folks that have gotten into it later in life and I really feel like they could have, you know, benefited had they been in those early programs. So I, I will say that I do think the early school, school age programs are a good thing, you know, for people getting their mindset correct. So a lot, a lot of folks who are listening to this are from other places besides Obion County, and maybe they don't know anything about um, agriculture or, or what farming uh, consists of. Um, tell us about the farm that, I mean, a farm means a lot of things to a lot of people. So tell us what your farm consists of. Sure. So I, I will agree that farming is different everywhere you go. Um, even different in this County to a lot of different extents, but our personal farm. So we're mainly a row crop operation. We farm corn, soybeans, wheat, we grow cover crops. We'll grow some cover crop for seed to harvest to use. And then we've got a cattle operation. We've got some cow calf pairs. We run stocker cattle and stocker cattle are just weaned calves that you wean off of the cow and run them on grass or cover crops at a different time. And then we've got a, a beef operation, I call it. So we'll actually take those animals that come off of grass and we'll finish them out and then sell them as like a, you know, a whole or a half or quarter steer to just different families that we do business with in our community here. I have actually bought some of your uh, beef before, and it's a yeah. lot different if, if, for, for people listening who don't know for you, how, how is the beef that you get from someone like yourself different than the beef that you might buy from uh, a grocery store? That's a, that's a good question. There's definitely a different taste. Um, the ground beef I have found to be the most different, and I really don't know the reason for that. I don't know if there's so many other channels that, you know, regular beef goes through to where I, I really don't know. I don't, I don't want to talk negatively about that industry, but I wish I had the full details on, you know, the actual main differences. Um, but like the beef art, you know, that we raise and process to sell, it's going to a local processor and they'll, you know, process it and you get that actual animal back. And I feel like, you know, the industry standard for beef and different things, you know, ground beef, that may be several different animals going into 
you know, the ground beef. I don't really know, but. Well, I think it's uh, just like anything else The the things that, um, take a little bit more care and a little bit more work are going to cost a little bit more. And so, you know, that's just the, the way it is. And I, I really liked uh, the taste, but it is very different than, than what you get. And it was uh, really good. What uh, you might've said this a while ago, what, what kind of beef, uh, what uh, my, my grandfather raised black Angus, what mm -hmm. kind of beef are you raising? So primarily Angus, uh, we've got some registered black Angus cattle, some red Angus cattle. I do have a few uh, Charlotte cross cows that will breed back to Angus bulls, but we haven't been too picky on color. Um, color matters to a lot of people, I think, but we've been real selective on, you know, good cows. And I'm not too, too picky on what color they are as long as they do their job well and I guess that's been our main focus. Now we we do have some registered black Angus cattle that we use just to as a little project, but to answer your question, primarily Angus base. And then um also um you also aren't just beef, the pork part of it. What kind of uh pigs? Sure enough. Yeah. Um that's been a that's been a family deal, I guess, forever. We've always had some hogs around here and uh dad's got two grandkids now, so he thought he needed to get back in that business but he uh he bought some berkshire uh sows and a boar and now we're raising uh berkshire pork so it's a little bit different too um we went a long time you know and didn't have any farm hogs around so we were buying you know all of our pork and now we're eating what we grow and it's it's a little different yeah it's good but it's it's a different do i remember for some reason you you don't I bought some beef from you guys one time out of a food truck, or did you experiment with that at one time? I, I'm trying we to did. remember. It's been a few years ago. Yeah, that's kind of how we got started. So coming back from college, I needed to, uh, I needed to add or create some room. Uh, it's a little bit challenging coming back to a farm operation because a lot of the times, you know, things are kind of set and, uh, you just got to make room. So we started the uh, beef business and a way to get that off the ground. We started selling retail product just to kind of get our name out there and let people try it because that is a, it is a big cost, you know, you know, it's hard to pencil in, you know, a couple thousand dollars to spend on a steer if you don't know what you're getting. And that was our main purpose and reason for doing that. Just kind of let people try it and kind of get to trust it before they spent that kind of money. But we did that for about three years, and it worked out really well. It helped us a lot. Now, t talk me through your um, post-high school. Did you go to UT Martin? I did, yes, sir. And that's where I think you picked up your biggest asset to your entire farm operation today is your wife, Michaela. Yeah, 100%. Uh, she's, the, uh, she's the financial brain here for sure. She keeps me in line on paper and she she has taken care of the cattle operation too. And uh she's she's a huge asset. But I actually met her. She's from southeast Missouri. She had a lot of cattle experience and uh I got to bring that back here with me. So she's she's been a huge, huge player in this and really a big reason for our success. So she's also uh, a social media guru. Um <laughs> You know, you guys are, you guys have like probably the highest level of social media as far as quality and content. And I mean, she is just, she is just killing it with that. I appreciate that. Yeah. That's all hard too. It was, if it was left up to me, it'd look like a third grader. <laughs> she, she did a great job. Yeah. I suspect that you probably would be too busy um farming to actually do the amount of really good quality work that she does when it comes to blogs and website and social media and she really is a superstar and you got two kids too right the youngest yeah. ones i mean the oldest one's probably close to five at this point four or five yeah, he's, uh, he just turned three and okay. we got a little nearly eight month old so it's it's fairly chaotic around here now but yeah i can imagine that it would be um we're gonna take um a quick break and when we get back we're gonna talk a little bit about innovation in agriculture as an all-state rep in martin jared mayo's knowledge and understanding of the people in this community and surrounding areas help him provide customers with an outstanding level of service 
He helps families like yours protect the things that are important, your family, your home, your car, and more. Jared Mayo serves O'Bine, Weekly, and Gibson Counties. Get your quote today at allstate.com slash Jared Mayo. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and we're chatting today about farming and agriculture with Derek Giffen. Um, Derek, I you really helped us a lot when it came to our ag exhibit, um, agriculture innovating for our survival out at the Simmons Bank Ag Center. We've done a lot with agriculture in the year since then, but you know, one of the things that I was the most uh, surprised about was how few young people really saw agriculture, first of all, as a career potential. And then also how many young people um, um, even could describe what a farmer is. We're going to play a little clip of a focus group that we did with young people that were here at Discovery Park to hear what their thoughts were on uh, who is a farmer today. Uh, they usually use tractors to uh, grab all their food from the crops, like corn and stuff. Um, they usually wear overalls and boots so they don't get stepped on by the animals. Uh, a farmer likes to feed cows. Overalls. He might have a beard. <laughs> oh, McDonald. <laughs> um, usually I think they wear a straw hat and they have overalls and long sleeve shirts even though it's really hot a farmer is somebody that that grows all the crops and take care of the animals so that we have food to eat so i think derek while you're out obviously those young people uh didn't have you in mind when they were thinking of who is a farmer uh, what are some of the things that you and Michaela are doing to try to help get the word out and advocate about agriculture today? So I would say that is a big challenge um, just because of how different farming is now than it was 20 years ago even. And I would I would say farmers have a huge opportunity to um, impact the environment around us. I mean, we really do. We're in touch with it and tune with it every day. We're out there, you know, we're around it. And to kind of communicate that, um, we have, this is, I guess, a selfish plug here, but we've, we've started a YouTube channel and one of our biggest, uh, I guess challenges we've experienced is just trying to farm a little bit differently and a little bit more in tune with nature over the past five to seven years. And there's a lot of struggles that come with that. And we've tried to kind of help communicate that on the YouTube platform and tried to kind of show people um, maybe a little bit different way to think about things. But, and as we go forward, you know, we're pretty fresh into that, but as we go forward, just kind of showing folks how things work and who we are on there, just to kind of, you know, give them a firsthand experience of maybe what a day-to-day, you know, operation looks like. And I think communication is key, but then giving someone a visual representation of what we're actually doing and what we look like and everything like that can really change someone's perspective. What what do you feel like is your biggest challenge that you have to deal with? Uh, I know there's a lot of challenges in uh, farming today, and a lot of us, even those of us that live here in O'Brien County, we drive around surrounded by agriculture, and yet we don't really know. the. Cha- I know enough to know that when it's not raining, that if people don't have one of those big, long things that waters, that they're probably freaking out or that if it rains too much or if they plant too early or too late. So I think most people are like me. We know that much. But what what are the biggest challenges you're facing as a farmer? Like you said, there's a lot um, and a lot of those things we can't control. But I guess one of the biggest challenges we can control. So farming 
at the end of the day is a relationship business. I mean, you've got relationships with everyone. You've got relationships with your people that you buy your inputs from, the people you're leasing the land from. Um, I would say one of the biggest challenges we face is just the communication aspect of that. You know, being able to communicate with the landowner, with, uh, you know, the people that we're having a direct impact with daily and trying to kind of help them understand the process, um, what we're doing and what we're, you know, what our goals are. Uh, farmers are really bad about, I guess, kind of talking about what we're doing and, it would, it is challenging to find the time to, you know, do better about communicating with those people. But, um, I think if we could do a better job of that, our life would be a lot easier. Now I know, um, you often don't hear like farmers oftentimes don't get awards, but you guys are, you and Michaela were, are, can say you're award-winning farmers because you won, it's been a couple of years ago, but the farm bureau, Farmers of the Year. Tell me a little bit about what that was and what it comprised of. Sure. Yeah, we were yeah very fortunate. Um, had a lot of help, uh, a lot of help. But Farm Bureau has got a uh, organization called Young Farmers and Ranchers, and uh, every year they've got a, a competition where uh, farm families apply. You know, they uh, go comb through your business and kind of look at everything, what you're doing, and what you've changed over time, and we were very fortunate. We won that for the state and then, uh, they let us go to the national competition and we got uh, second place there. And it was a huge, it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and we had a lot of help, <clears throat> but I guess to kind of give you an overview of that, they, you submit, you know, what you've been doing, uh, all your, basically your financial records and everything and kind of show them how you've, changed over the time since you've started and what you've done to kind of help improve the the business or create a business or different things like that so um that's pretty much the gist and a lot of a lot of community involvement you know there's they're pretty uh pretty high on that i guess but when i say community involvement you know just being being willing to participate in different things like maybe some boards or something like that within the community and just have some kind of presence, you know? So what is next for the Giffins um, on the farm? Uh, that's a good question. Um, we're always trying to improve, you know, we've got plenty of room to do that. Uh, I think everyone probably does, but we, uh, our main, our main economic engine, I guess you would say, is row crops, and we're we're very focused on that. But you know this cattle deal, so there's a whole lot of opportunity there um, to bring back cattle to a grazing system that kind of complements a row crop operation, and um, we're working really hard to figure out that perfect, uh, I guess, dynamic. So you know if we can. We can grow row crops and then plant a cover crop back on those same acres and then bring cattle in to graze that and kind of add some value to the land. And it's just a, it's really a beautiful system. I could talk forever on that topic, but <laughs> kind of where we're, uh, where we're trending or where we're headed, I guess, or where we want to go. I should so say. If someone's listening and they want to find out more about what you and Michaela are doing, where should they go? Um, I guess for a, a, uh, more current update youtube would be a good option it's just giffen farms uh on youtube and then we've got a website and a facebook page same name giffen farms but that's g-i-f-f-i-n and if people if people google you they you also lots of content comes up um there's a lot of info out there on some of the stuff that you guys are doing uh kudos and thank you from all of us that uh eat and wear clothes and drive uh cars thank you to you and all the other uh folks working in agriculture for the stuff you're doing thank y'all and thanks to all of you listeners who joined us today at discovery park of america our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond to plan an experience here for you and your family visit discoveryparkofamerica.com 